Okay, let's pray. Then we'll get into the Word. Father, we thank you so much tonight for your Word. Thank you, Lord, because it is spirit and it is life. We ask that tonight, Holy God, in the name of Jesus, that you would minister to these people tonight. Give us inspired revelation knowledge of the Word of God. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher tonight. I pray that you would anoint the ears, the hearts, and the minds of everyone that's present tonight. And we'll go out of this place tonight with revelation knowledge that we did not know nor understand before. And we thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've extended to us. We thank you, Lord, that we are growing in grace and knowledge. Father, we just give you praise. We give you honor. For you are worthy of it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I was talking with Eloise today on the phone. She was sharing some things with me. and We were talking. And uh, I want to share this with you very quick before we get into the Word. She's telling me that sometimes when she's sitting back there, you know, that uh, when I'm teaching up here, that sometimes she gets revelation knowledge of certain little things, you know, when I'm teaching. And that's wonderful that God does that. You know, I'm aware that God shows you people things at times. He may not be showing me. He may bring something to you while I'm teaching that he's not speaking to me at that time. So we were talking about it, though, and she said the only thing about it bothered her is if, if, if it comes to someone and they want to speak it out at that time while I'm ministering the word, that it throws her off. It throws a lot of people off. So I'm going to ask you tonight, if the Lord does speak to you anything that you would like to share with the body tonight, if there's anything you feel led of the Holy Ghost to bring forth, you have your liberty. But I ask you to please hold it until I'm finished teaching. Uh, if you have a piece of paper and pencil, mark down whatever scripture the Holy Ghost is bringing to you. Mark down that little thought that comes to you. And as soon as I'm finished up here, I'll be more than happy to listen to whatever the Holy Spirit would have you say. Because I'm sure it will fit right in with whatever I'm teaching on. Maybe it will bring more insight into what, what I am teaching on. Because, you know, a lot of times the Holy Spirit can teach you something that he's not even teaching me while I'm just teaching. I don't know how else to explain that to you. I've had it happen to me before. And a lot of times, you know, you need to share that with the body of Christ. But so we won't have any confusion and people won't lose track of where I'm at. We'll just, we'll hold them, okay, please, till the end of it, okay? Now, I want to share with you tonight, before we start off in Galatians chapter 2, just very quickly, over in Galatians 1, we don't even have to need to go back over there and read. I'm just going to give you a little, uh, whatever, repeat from last week. I want you to see something here I didn't share with you last week about this. We talked about those first three little verses there, verses 3, 4, and 5, in Galatians chapter 1, where Paul simply gave the entire plan of salvation there. That's why I believe that little word, amen, is in there. So be it, that was the end of what Paul was talking about. And we were talking about how he had to go on for another five or six chapters to discuss the problem in the church. But Paul gave them the entire answer to their problem in those first little, those little three verses, in verse 3, 4, and 5 of chapter 1. Now, the thing I want you to notice about those little three verses when he said amen, notice Paul never mentioned anything about the Jewish law. He never mentioned anything about animal sacrifices. He never mentioned anything about dietary restrictions. He never mentioned anything about dress codes or hair codes. He made no list of do's and don'ts. How many of you ever noticed that when you read that? Well, I did. Now, I want to share something with you before we go on into chapter 2. You know religion or religious spirit. How many of you know we know it's sources from the enemy? We know... It comes from Satan. But how does Satan do it? It comes into the minds of men. He speaks it into the minds of men and convinces them. And then what happens? Men pass it on through their teaching. Men pass it on through their teaching. That's how that spirit is moving all the time, moving all the time. First of all, before you can pass on to somebody else something, church, he has to convince you, doesn't he? And once he's got you convinced, hell's not going to stop you. You're going to go out and teach it or whatever. That's the way a religious spirit works. He talks them into certain things that's contrary to the word of God. They get his old religious spirit, and they go out and they try to preach it and teach it to other people. And a lot of people who don't have the correct wisdom of the word of God will fall into it. That's how cults get started. Now, so anyway, the gospel, we know how it comes. It comes directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. It does not come from just man. It comes directly from revelation knowledge. By the Lord Jesus Christ, or personal revelation, such as was with Paul, religion is something. Here's something else I wrote. This will help you. Religion is simply man trying to achieve salvation or justification, redemption, whatever, by his own efforts. And how many of you know that spirit of religion will blind you to the truth? It will blind you to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you know it had the Apostle Paul blinded? Didn't it? 
Yes, it did. And how many of you know personal works could save anybody? They certainly would have saved the Apostle Paul. He was a zealous Jew, brother. I mean, he was high up in rank in his, his uh, Jewish religion. Let me tell you something. If anybody could have been saved by their own efforts and by their own works, it would have been Paul. Because remember, the more he persecuted the church of God, the more he advanced in his Jewish religion. Any time that you have to go against the word of God and advance, as they call it, advance or move up in your religion, that's what you're into, religion. Amen? You know, I was thinking about India over there, talking about an old religious spirit. I believe I shared this with you some time ago, but I'd like to share it with you again. The, 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 the nation of India over there is such a poverty-stricken nation. Not really it's not, but the way they actually think it was. But, I mean, they, they have so much fame over there, and they have so much starvation and so many horrible things happening in their land. And they'll actually lay over there in the streets, and they will die of starvation while food walks right by them on the street. I mean, those cows are so sacrilegious. Those cows are so important. They wouldn't dare kill that food walking around to keep them starving to death. Somehow it got into man. Man taught it. That religious spirit got in India. And those cows are dominant. Well, you couldn't kill that cow and eat that thing. That might be your grandmother, your grandfather reincarnated. Well, I don't dare do that. I mean, church, they're dead serious. They're laying over there dying. And those cows are walking along in the street. That's how bad a religious spirit can destroy you. It can kill you physically and mentally and every other way. It'll kill you. I'll tell you one thing. A religious spirit will kill you spiritually. It did Paul. Paul thought he was right. He thought the things he was doing in the name of God and for God was all right. That's how blinded it had him. That religious spirit, church, is nothing to fool with. How many of you know that? You see, something else I found out about that old religious spirit in the years I've served God, too. God showed me this about it. He said, Judy is so hard for a person with a religious spirit. Because I asked him, I said, Lord, why is it so hard to get anything through to somebody that has that old religious spirit? It's so hard to minister to them. It's hard to even make them understand salvation by grace. And the Lord spoke to me with something. He said, Judy, the reason it's so hard for someone with a religious spirit to receive is because they are taught that they have to achieve. Now, did you hear what I said? You can't teach them nothing because they're already taught, I have to do this or that or do certain works. I have to achieve my salvation. I have to achieve my justification. I have to achieve my righteousness. I must have to do something to get right with God. You can't teach them nothing. It's hard. The only way you can do is lay hands on them and bind that thing and command it to go and hope they'll release it and let it go. It's so hard to teach them anything. You think you go over to an Indian and say, hey, why don't you kill that cow and eat it? No way. It's generations of generations steeped into them people. They say, no, we'll lay right here and die while that cow walks along in the road. Well, don't you know that's our religion? That's our religion. And that religion's killing them. Huh? Let them starve to death. What it is, too, when you get in that old religious spirit, look how proud Paul was of their rituals. The Jews, they were so proud of their traditions, their little rituals, and their good deeds. You see, it's almost impossible, as I said, to expect someone who has a real religious spirit to accept salvation just by faith. You can't hardly get them to do it. Now, Paul said, I already went over that with you, so I'm not going to go over that again, but Paul was talking about how he profited in the Jews' religion among many his own equals. He said the more he persecuted the church, the more he advanced in his Jewish religion. How many of you know that Paul was on what I call a vicious cycle? Something church had to give. And you remember what Jesus said? He said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? So something had to fall, church. It was not the church that fell. I mean, you know, it was Paul on that road to Damascus. Paul was the one to fall. And I'll tell you something else. You know, Paul thought he was such a good Christian, I suppose. I don't, I don't think Christian is the right word. Paul thought he was such a good Jewish uh, candidate, whatever you would call Paul. He thought he was so good. But on that road to Damascus when he fell... And he looked up, and he, and he saw it was Jesus. Do you know who Paul came face to face with that day? Himself. And when he came face to face with himself, he didn't see Paul, the great Jewish whatever. He saw Paul, the chief of the sinners. Just that quick, brother. Paul was looking face to face at himself. He said, oh, my 